Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Today, we're going to get into part three of Transform Your Service Experience, Make Every Customer First Priority. First, let me introduce myself and my team here today. I'm Adrian, the Product Marketing Manager here at Internet Creations, and this is also Howard, who is the Director of Product at Internet Creations. You might recognize Howard because he is a regular host and expert on many of our webinars, both for service and for our products. Hello, everyone. Good to see you here and looking forward to talking. And let's, I also want to welcome our other panelists who are here today. We are so glad to have you here with us today and really appreciate you being on this webinar. Jeff is the Vice President of Customer Success at MSC Software. MSC Software specializes in simulation software that allows for manufacturers to see how products will behave in the real world. And Andy Rattler is the Director of Customer and Order Administration at Integrated DNA Technologies in Coralville, Iowa. IDT develops manufacturers and markets nucleic acid products that support the life sciences industry in the areas of academic and commercial research, agricultural, medical, diagnostics, and pharmaceutical development. Andy, can you fill in what you do at Integrated DNA Technologies? Uh, Jeff, I'm going to go ahead and go over to you. I think we might have some technical difficulties for Andy. Andy, are you there now? Yeah, yep. Sorry. Yeah. My apologies. <laughs> uh, so I'm in <laughs> no charge problem. of the... <laughs> off to a great start. My apologies. So I'm in charge of the customer care team uh, and the sales order management team. So my team uh, talks to customers uh, regarding orders and kind of basic customer service questions and then uh, my other team processes the orders. Awesome. Great. Uh, and Jeff, can you fill us in with, with what you do at MSC Software, please? Sure thing. First, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay, great. So um, I'm responsible for global technical support as well as our customer training program. And so, um, you know, when we sell so our software to company, there's several end users and when they have questions regarding the use of our of our software then they contact my team so that's basically it great thank you yeah. um so before we get started we want to show you where you can ask questions and go to webinar uh, we will be answering questions throughout the webinar so feel free to ask throughout the first question i have for all of our listeners is where are you we are here in sunny Hamilton, New Jersey, and we also have another office in Dallas. Let us know where you are. And while everyone's logging in their locations, Jeff, where are you signing in from? I'm in sunny Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> Perfect. Sunny state. Yes. <laughs> the sunny thing. Andy, how about you? I'm in Coralville, Iowa, which is just outside of Iowa City. Nice. Okay. Got it. Let's see where else some people are here. So it looks like we have people tuning in from Nashville. Um, we always have Nashville um, representing here uh, for our webinars. So thank you so much for always joining with us and supporting us here at Internet Creations. Um, we have some people calling in from Dallas, Texas, um, from Ontario, Canada. And it looks like we have some other people tuning in from Charleston. Um, oh, and I see somebody um, just just told us that they are tuning in from the West Coast as well. Very nice. Great. Okay, let's review our agenda for today. We are going to go over why we need to be responsive, things that hurt responsiveness, the impact on KPIs, and the tools to improve responsiveness. So, first question is, what is it that customers actually want? Salesforce data service tells us that 80% of customers say the, the experience the company provides is as important as its products and services. And then there's another metric that tells us that more than half of customers compl complain that most companies fall short of their expectations for great experience, experiences. So, things are clearly not matching up here. 
companies know it's important to be responsive. However, many of us are falling short in different areas to keep up with customers' demands and their expectations. What are these gaps and how do we identify and resolve them? Let's start with defining what responsive is, which is defined by internet creations. Responsiveness is one of our key pillars of the service experience suite. This pillar is essential for a company's brand. Responsiveness is the first thing a customer notices and is perhaps the most important part of a customer service experience. Responsiveness is more than just about being fast and answering a customer. It's about really listening to what the customer needs and anticipating those needs. Customers need to feel like they are number one priority. When you focus on being responsive, support teams can organize workflows by prioritizing the right cases and measuring follow-ups to your customers. If you don't have this right, you should start over. Now that we've defined what it means to be responsive, let's hear how our panelists define it. Jeff, what does it mean to you to be responsive? So um, what it means to us is when we're working on an issue, um, you know, some of our questions are, very few of them are one and done. So many of them take, you know, multiple back and forth customer. What's most important is that even if we're, we're you know, researching the problem or, you know, we're working on it, um, it's important that we keep the customer in the loop. So the customer's not, you know, wondering if we're even working on it. So, um, you know, we have to regularly let the customer know what's going on. And, you know, again, some of our questions could take days. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't get back to the customer in days. So regular updates, you know, even multiple times throughout the day. So the customer is, he or she knows we're on it, we're working on it, and, uh, you know, stay tuned. Yeah, that's, that's important. And I think that even when there's silence, from a customer, it doesn't mean that you don't want to touch back with them to let them know that you're working through through the case. That's right. That's right. I mean, if we leave, you know, silence equals, you know, customer perception. They're just, you know, we don't know what they're thinking. And so let's get in front of that. Great. Great. Andy, uh, how do you define responsive? I think Jeff made a great point in terms of communicating with customers throughout the process, even if you have to work on it internally. I think if, from a customer's perspective, you know, you really risk credibility with your customer if there's long periods of time where they're not hearing back from you. So I think frequent updates are important. I think with our customers, the, the nature of our inquiries uh, go from anywhere from pretty quick and, and simple uh, standard customer service sorts of questions like pricing and things like that up to and including troubleshooting on a specific experiment that they're using our products for. So I, I, I think the key is to be to, to really prioritize constant communication with the customer. You want a fast initial response, certainly, and then from there you can, you can kind of uh, maintain that credibility with your customers by uh, reacting quickly and, and being as transparent as possible with your progress. I want to add one thing because both of you have a, you know, you're, you're sort of hitting all the things that I would normally talk about, but it's okay for the customer to dawdle. So sometimes things go back and forth. And when the customer takes, you know, hours, days, weeks, and they don't get back to you, we have to be okay with that. We don't have to like let that just happen, but it's never okay for us and then that service organization to dawdle. And if the customer doesn't hear you, they're going to assume that you're dawdling. So yeah, it might take, you know, Jeff, when you mentioned it sometimes takes several days or a week to really get that answer, even saying back to the customer, hey, I'm of a meeting with the engineer this afternoon. We're talking about this. We're trying to reproduce this here. Going into those nuances and letting the customer know that you aren't dawdling is so paramount so that they feel like you're being responsive to their needs, even though it might take a while. Of course, we never ask the customer, why didn't you get back to us with the information that we needed for the past three weeks? We just, when we get it, we get it and we work from there. So there's this, uh, the back and forth, never okay for us to dawdle, but customer can dawdle all they want. Good point, Howard. 
So the next question, uh, just to follow up with what we've been talking about, are what methods are you using to communicate with your customers? Example, phone, email, chat, et cetera. Um, Andy, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Sure. For us, our primary communication channels are phone, email, and chat. Okay, great. And um, Jeff, what about you as well? Um, so in terms of customers submitting their requests for the first time, we actually do have a, uh, a web portal, and we encourage our customers to go onto the web and log in and submit their case. And then um, actually, it's not just when they submit the case, but even regular updates, they can use the web portal. This is, this is in addition to phone and email. Great. This, that, that's very helpful. Um, Jeff, you've mentioned before that your customers' questions can tend to be complex. Uh, what's the average number of touches or interactions that your agents have on a case with your customers? The average number of back and forth is about five. Okay. So, yeah. so you know, there's some that are <laughs> actually, I haven't measured it in a while. It's probably a little bit north of five. Um, again, very few are one and dones. And so mm. we do have to go back and forth a few times, but the average is five or six. Okay. Andy, do your cases act in a similar way as well? Yeah, it, it you know, we do have a, a, a good percentage that are one and dones on, on the simple side, but on the more complicated side, it can be kind of right in the range that Jeff kind of discussed, maybe five or six kind of in there, depending on who, you know, the, the other teams that we have to bring in uh, for for my team in customer care uh, you know we're primarily doing some uh, kind of standard customer service uh, and you know account maintenance that sort of thing but if, if we have to escalate to our science you know we have lab scientists that are uh, make up one of our support groups so if we need to escalate to that group then that's where it can get a lot more complicated okay yeah and that's important to note because I think there are different things that we're talking about now that can hurt responsiveness. And if you're relying on a first in, first out approach, some cases interactions can get lost or fall through the cracks. Uh, so Jeff, can you tell me what you feel hurts responsiveness? Sure thing. Um, so I think what, what hurts responsiveness is, um, well, so when we talk about, let me specifically talk about initial responsiveness. So when the customer submits a request, obviously they want someone to get back to them to know we got it, we're working on it, and maybe even better than that, right? Um, what hurts is just some automated email that says your, your case has been logged as ticket 12345, and then they don't hear back from us until, you know, five hours or the next day. So just an automated response is not at all good enough. And in addition to that, uh, even if it's a response from a human being that says your ticket is one, two, three, four, five, that's also not good enough. Um, what I stress to my team is um, the, the initial response should be the natural response in going down the path of solving the problem. So it could be, you know, what version are you using? Or, you know, have you tried these things? It should be the natural first response, not just some blanket email um, that doesn't really provide value. So I definitely think that that's one scenario that hurts responsiveness. It has to be a true natural response in actually solving the problem. I, it's actually something that uh, we stress here as part of knowledge centered service. It's really like you might not be able to answer the question, but you start really digging into the context, what's happening with that customer. Because very often when they su submit that initial request, they send an email through a web form, phone call. That initial response should be, and Jeff, to your point about getting it in, in motion, it's yes. really establishing like what's going on. And yeah. even that, like if you respond to someone really, really quickly, you can't solve it right away, but it's just like, tell me what's going on, what's the problem you're trying to solve where you get this issue. Just that, the customer all of a sudden, it's like they get a sense of relief, like there's a human behind this. Yeah, exactly. 
Andy, how about you? What do you feel hurts responsiveness? Yeah, I, I think ultimately customers just want to be heard. And I think a lot of times a customer experience for any customer uh, can be shaped by the most negative customer experiences that you've had. So I, I think it's important it's important to really nail that first interaction and make sure that customer understands that, that you care and that you're willing to investigate their issue and that you hear them. I think beyond that, it's, it's also important to have a pretty organized strategy in balancing the speed of initial response. I think consistency is very, very important for customers as well. So you need to be able to, from a, you know, from a broader perspective, you need to be able to react to different surges of activity you know, on certain communication channels to make absolutely sure that you're not, uh, not falling way behind your service metrics at any point uh, in any given time. Uh, because that, that can really erode uh, a customer's confidence uh, in your brand as well. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, I think that uh, it's really important to have that done first and foremost because customers are expecting that you'll respond to them right away. Right. So, so what are some common mistakes that people make when trying to be responsive to their customers? Jeff, do you want to field this question first? Well, I just want to reiterate what I said. It's, I mean, that's that that the example that I gave a moment ago um, is probably the best example of a mistake. I've seen it so many times, and when I'm auditing our, you know, support engineers' cases, and you know, we have a metric. Um, you know, one of our few KPIs is initial responsiveness, and um, you know, again, we measure it. We put it in people's goals and objectives. And uh, and we regularly review it, and I don't want people to just meet the metric because it's mm. a it's a false positive, right? It has to be. I would much rather have us miss the metric a little bit, hopefully not a lot, but a little mm. bit, but still meet the spirit of the initial response, which is you know, as Howard said, really getting into the you know the the the, the um, support engineer assigned to the case getting into it, trying to understand what's going on, um, and, and, and getting back to the customer with the first, you know, I, I mentioned this before and I'll say it again, the first natural response in solving the problem. Not just, you know, I gotta hit my metric and so, you know, so my dashboard looks good. It's not about that. Right, not, right. It's about the quality of the responses and the solution. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, you know, I, I know I'm sort of repeating what I said a moment ago, but that is the most common mistake that I've seen. Great. Thank you. Uh, and Andy, um, can you let uh, tell us what are common mistakes that people make? Yeah, I, I think, you know, in a, in a customer service role, it can be really easy to get into a mindset of just being transactional, trying to, to, you know, re react quickly, but not be not provide a comprehensive solution to a customer, and just close out that case, and you know get off the phone and kind of plow ahead to the next one. I think it's a really easy trap to fall into if you do have a high call volume day or email volume day. So one of the things that we really stress is kind of you know uh, driving to issue resolution, and that that's really what uh, how we stack our our training and we, we make a big emphasis on that with with all of our employees and, and associates that you know while we we do measure response times we have service level metrics across all of our communication channels but really the most important thing is resolving that issue and making sure that we're adding value to the to the equation and not just getting somebody off the phone uh, as Jeff as Jeff kind of indicated to uh, it's not just about hitting that number service needs to be a value add as well and one other thing that I want to add, you know, a challenge that we see here sometimes is we see a lot of the same problems and we think that they are the same problems. So it's, it's almost that little confirmation bias where one customer had an issue and you work with them and you dug in and you solved it yesterday. And then another customer shows up with something that sounds, acts, sort of exists almost identical. 
And then it's like, oh, this is the fix. And they don't necessarily capture the context. So it's that trade-off of, hey, we've seen this before. Here's the solution, as opposed to diving in a little bit. It's, it's really, really tempting because you want to do right by the customer and get them an answer fast. But then sometimes the customer will say, oh, well, I tried that already, but what I really was seeing was this, and it's us missing the context. So that's, for me, what Hearst Responsiveness is kind of assuming that you can substitute the speed from your previous interaction with the digging in that you have to do. Great. Um, so this actually leads us right into our next area, which is the key performance indicators. Uh, one of the tools in particular that a lot of service organizations are still relying on, which we're actually talking about now, is this first response time. This is a great metric to use, but it only tells one part of the story. First response time, also known as the initial response time, measures only how quickly agents reply the first time. This metric does not measure the quality of the response, the time to follow up responses, or the resolution. When you are measuring only FRT, you are encouraging your agents to close cases prematurely before the issue is resolved. The outcome is unresolved issues, which translate to frustrated customers that end up opening additional cases in additional channels. This creates a new problem, duplicate cases or something called channel thrashing. The system ends up breaking down if the resolution isn't the main objective and customer satisfaction will suffer from this. Andy, do you have some examples where your agents may have focused on closing cases rather than fully resolving an issue? Absolutely. I, I think it's a, it's a common uh, obstacle, particularly with our newest employees. I, I think that's something that it's easy to kind of fall into that, that mindset. Uh, and, you know, we, we, have, we have lots of examples of, of that uh, on, on the team. It's important to break that mindset, as you kind of laid out as well, that, that uh, it's not, you know, again, we want to focus on resolving that, that issue. We had an issue a couple of weeks ago where uh, one of our agents was troubleshooting a web order, and uh, because you know one of the one common uh, inquiry that we'll get, you know, we have a, a lot of design tools on our website. You know, we our product is custom DNA sequences that we manufacture from scratch. So our customers indicate their specific sequence online and there's different ways to design that and uh, the, the the agents essentially skipped over some important troubleshooting questions because they made some wrong assumptions about uh, what the customer was was trying to resign uh, tr trying to design and uh, and it, it complicated things ultimately we, we caught it and we figured it out and it was it was a minor mistake didn't cause too many problems for the customer because they were able to kind of figure it out too. But it was a coaching moment and, and a good example of what you're kind of talking about here where uh, if you get too focused on closing that case and not driving to is issue resolution, you can really uh, create some uh, collateral damage. Interesting. Um, Jeff, can you give me some examples as well? So, um, sure, I'd love to, although uh, my feedback is, is a little more, you know, it's generic as opposed to a specific example. But um, so in, our, um, in our, our support processes, we have three KPIs. We measure initial responsiveness. And again, it has to be a good, valid, natural initial response in, towards solving the problem. The second thing, the second metric is resolution time, which is how long is the ball in our court? How long is the customer waiting on us to actually, you know, throughout the life cycle of the case? So, um, you know, as Howard mentioned, sometimes we're, sometimes the customer's waiting on us and it's, you know, we, we can, I forget the term Howard used, but, you know, we can't just not get back to the customer and keep, keep him or her informed. We have to do that very, dawdling, is that what you said, Howard? No dawdling, no dawdling allowed. No it's okay for the customer, but not for us. There you go, there you go, exactly. So, and so there are times when we wait on the customer and it is what it is, but when we measure um, our overall uh, resolution time, 
we actually don't count what we're waiting on the customer because that's unfair. That's not real. We're waiting on them to get back to us, even if it's thank you very much for solving my problem. The third KPI is, I'm, I call it sort of the great equalizer. And it's not a time-based metric, but it's a customer perception metric. At the end of the day, we say, how did we do through a survey? And right now, our response rate is about 15%. It's not it's not enough. We're gonna um, do some make some changes so we drive it up to you know forty percent through you know an embedded survey in the email itself. At least I'd like to see forty percent. But we get you know hundreds of surveys every you know every month. So what I've seen is that kind of gives a good indication. If you have enough of a sample size, it's it's you know it's pretty good. Um, so yes, we have support engineers that focus. Um, that kind of have the mindset of I've got to close that case, right, to keep my productivity up. But at the end of the day, what I say to my team is the most important thing is help the customer solve their problem. Maybe they're even asking the wrong question, right, which happens quite often. So try to understand what they're really trying to do and be a trusted advisor. Our job is not to close cases. Our job is to make the customer successful. We can't not have metrics. Right. I mean, we have to have KPIs and you know response time and resolution time and surveys. But at the end of the day, it's about securing that, you know, that renewal revenue. And the way we're going to do that is, quite frankly, getting in the customer's shoes, being their trusted advisor and and going above and beyond. So great. I think those are really interesting points. I really like the point about the um, ball in, in your court. And I also like that you mentioned surveys. Uh, it's great that you mentioned that because that's actually going to be um, our next topic for our webinar later this month. The end of August. Yeah. Yeah. October. October. Oh my God, yeah. what happens August? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've looked at how KPIs are impacted when we're focused on one specific KPI, like first response time. Let's look at how other KPIs are impacted. Andy, how many cases do each of you typically, or I'll start with Andy, how many cases do you typically see a month? So uh, I, I have kind of our, our daily breakdown. We, we typically on our, our combined, uh, kind of combined across different channels, we, we see right around 650 every day. Wow, okay, that's a lot of cases. Uh, and Jeff, how about you? <laughs> that is a lot of cases. We see about 3,000 per month. Okay. <laughs> and can you both tell me what your team size is? Andy, go ahead and, and start. Sure. For our, uh, for our customer care team, we have 21 associates. Okay. And how about you, Jeff? Um, the number is approximately 80 support engineers throughout the world. Got it. So how do you both measure time and effort that your agents are spending on each case in terms of, you know, so it isn't just response time? What are the kinds of ways that you measure it? Andy? Sure. For, yeah, sure. For, uh, for ours, you know, we, our primary metrics look at response time. Uh, we don't have any quantitative measures for how much time our associates spend on a case, but we do, uh, from a qualitative standpoint, we do, do measure issue resolution. So we really de-emphasize the amount of time it takes to resolve that issue. Ultimately, you know, our, our message is we, we want you to resolve that issue and if, if it, you know, however long it takes uh, and just do that. So we, we look at response time kind of on the front end and then uh, our quality monitoring uh, team looks at the, you know, and, and we have a, a, essentially uh, a scoring system that we use to analyze whether that issue was resolved appropriately or not. And then we have a Great. quality score for the team. Awesome. Um, Jeff, how about you? So there are um, three, three customer-facing metrics, and I mentioned them a moment, a moment ago. So initial responsiveness, um, overall resolution time 
and then um, customer, sat uh, customer satisfaction through a short survey. So for every single case that we close, the customer will get a, an email saying, tell us how we did. So those are the customer facing uh, KPIs. Um, you know, Andy said it well, um, and so I wanna sort of echo the same thing as it relates to stressing how much, or not stressing how much time it takes a support engineer to um, solve a case. Sometimes they're they're shorter, and sometimes they are damn hard. And you know it's okay. I we you know we certainly stress quality, and uh, you know whenever you help a customer with that tough question, I want to make sure that it gets into our knowledge base, so we can you know capture and reuse that knowledge. And also in many cases, you know if it's a super tough question and it's the customer struggling, maybe there's an issue with product. And so we certainly, you know, I encourage our support engineers to um, provide feedback on a very regular basis to a product development team, not just on a bug, but also on an enhancement. Um, and so, you know, the way we measure internal productivity is um, we look at, so that's, I guess, a fourth KPI, but it's more internally focused. And we look at the number of cases well, so over a 40-hour period where the cust where our support engineer is actually, um, you know, working on support activity, meaning he's not on PTO or he's not, you know, teaching a class, for every five, every 40 hours of week on support, we measure how many cases did that person close, how many knowledge base articles did they write, and how many uh, change requests were submitted to product development, because each one of those three things takes time. So we say on average, you know, looking at that on average over, a, let's say a month or, or a quarter, what is that support engineer's productivity? And it's a metric and we look at it. Do we, you know, sometimes a, a productivity for a second level support person that happens to get the hardest questions throughout the world is going to be lower and that's why. So it's okay. What's not okay is just not not having the information to at least you look at it and, and, and every now and then you see, you know, you see something strange and then we dig into it. Great. Yeah, it seems to me that both of you are focusing a lot, are doing different things, but focusing on just the quality of the responses. Um, Jeff, you use one of our applications, Email the Case Premium. Can you share how that has helped uh, resolve your cases faster? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, Adrian. Thanks. Um, so we've been customers of Email to Case Premium. Oh, I think we deployed it in uh, Q1 of this year. And so um, we use Salesforce as our you know support tool. And for those of you on the call that use Salesforce, you you'll know that the communicate. If you have you know for for cases that are one and done, it's fine. And even for cases that are not, it works, but it absolutely does not work well. So we have you know, Salesforce has this concept of activities, and an email is an activity, but then they also have the concept of comments. And so if you have a web portal, then and the customer wants to log an update, then that's done through a comment. So you have this mixed bag of communication objects. And even with email, you send a response to the customer, the customer, you know, you, you send a message to the customer, an email, and then the customer hits reply as anyone would, and then that gets uploaded. And all of a sudden, your what you said to the customer is now in two of those objects because it doesn't truncate when the customer responded, it didn't truncate your message. And so the bottom line is, you know, for for um, support teams like ourselves, where um, there's you know the average number of back and forth is five or six, and sometimes it's twenty, you can't get in there and see who said what and when in a chronological order, in a chronological way, a reverse chronological, so you can s quickly see what the heck happened. So. Um, it, so as it relates to resolving cases faster, which was your question, it, email to case absolutely helps us uh, because number one, that support engineer that's working on his or her case can see exactly what happened from beginning to end. 
Um, and in addition to that, every single case that has a back and forth with a question and at the end of the day an answer, it's a knowledge artifact, right? It's like a knowledge, it's, a, it's like a knowledge article. And so we can now search the knowledge base, which is now our cases more effectively, more efficiently. We can see who said what and when and know if it's going to be helpful in resolving that person's case or not. So it's been a game changer for us. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a quick pause. Uh, we're actually going to answer a couple questions. We have a couple of people who are asking currently. Yeah, so the first question that just came in um, is, where do you place more weight in service metrics? What time to resolve or the quality and effectiveness of handling? And I think we touched on a little bit of that question, but um, you know, let's go into it a little bit deeper. Andy, would you like to answer this one? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think for us, the, this one's a pretty easy one. The, we really go all in on issue resolution, uh, and we're, you know, it's the the amount of time it takes you to solve a case is really secondary for us. You know, it's our our, our approach is, you know, take as long as you need to. And, and again, we we look very closely on initial response and want to make sure, and we have metrics in place so our associates are following up with customers but as long as you have that constant communication with a customer uh, as long as it, you're, you're providing timely updates uh, it's you can drive towards resolving that issue uh, and then we as I mentioned we're able to kind of measure the effectiveness of that through our, our quality team uh, that kind of analyzes uh, analyzes the, the calls and, and the emails so for us uh, yeah it's not it's not a hard decision for us. We really, really prioritize issue resolution, and you know, if, how, as long as it, you know, take as long as you need to on that case, uh, as long as you're driving in the right direction. Great. And the next question that we had come in is, you know, I think kind of that balance of speed versus quality. So how how are you? instilling the sense of urgency to get issues resolved quickly with that high level of quality and good communication. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you want to answer that one? Um, issues resolved quickly with high level of, well, I mean, I, I, I think the, the, the best way that we do this is by letting the support engineer know that um, that customer is going to rate rate you at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's coming back. It's coming full circle <laughs> for you. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, a person helping a person. So if you don't, you know, put yourself in the customer's shoes and, you know, act genuine and, and try to go above and beyond, it'll come right back in that survey. And again, I, you know, I've seen, I've heard people, poo-poo surveys like, oh, you're only going to get the people that are really happy or you're only going to get the people that are really, really upset. If you have enough of a sample size, then that has been, not been my experience. You get, you get, you know, sort of what you would think that support engineer is doing in terms of the quality of service. You know, like when things were, when things were not going well, right, we've had some, you know, some things going on in our company or, a new support engineer or whatever, then in aggregate, you would see lower scores. And when things were better in aggregate, you'd see higher scores. So at the end of the day, um, that's again, the great equalizer. So that is how I instill the sense of, of urgency. It's, Hey, the, you know, I tell, I tell the team, you know, yes, we have all of these KPIs, you know, in particular, I mentioned four, three that are customer facing and one that's internal facing, but by far, the the most important KPI is what the customer says. So that's couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's great. So um, one more just quick follow up question here: um, Is there a certain threshold that either of you um, follow where you would escalate to go directly from you know 
going back, going back and forth between email and then escalating like, let's hop on a phone call here, or do you just give your agents the flexibility to do whatever feels right in that moment? I'm going to turn that one over to Andy because, quite frankly, we don't have uh, good processes to to deal with that. It's it's an opportunity that we have. So, Andy, take it away <laughs> if you have any. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We our our philosophy is that we want to be channel agnostic, and we want to allow customers to speak with us in whatever channel they are most most comfortable with. So we give our our associates a lot of flexibility in how uh, in how they communicate with that customer. Uh, you know, we we give general guidance around you know if if you're having difficulty or if if you think that the current communication trend on any issue is becoming an obstacle, and that's specifically how we define it. Is the way you're communi uh, is this communication channel becoming an obstacle and taking you far away from is issue resolution? If it is, then th the training is essentially to explore another, uh, an another communication channel. But as a standard approach, that you know, if, if a customer reaches out to us via email, we want to stay in that communication channel um, if at all possible, and not and not move out unless unless the specific situation calls to it, as kind of defined by our guidelines. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's turn to look at how we can effectively solve cases in Salesforce. Andy, your company uses Case Flags, which, in full disclosure, is an internet creations app for Salesforce. Can you share? how your team reviews and solves the court cases with it. Absolutely. So uh, I love case flags. Uh, that's, that's been a real game changer for, for my team because it provides transparency uh, across you know, all the associates on the team in terms of uh, that important metric of you know, initial response. So everyone can see the different case flags in the queue and we have them set up at two hours four hours, six hours, and eight hour increments, and then uh, alerts in there as well, alerting not only team leads, but also managers if it's, if it's sitting there for too long. It's really allowed us to, to attack the you know, potential call or email surges, you know, specifically email in this case, uh, and it's been able to, uh, and we've been able to react just because of that visibility that we have with case flags. We can tell pretty quickly that if, if we're getting behind and we can check our, our dashboards that we use and just the visual check of, of the uh, blue flags or black flags in there. So it's allowed us to react really quickly when, when in the past uh, we were slower to react when we would get underwater on a certain communication channel. So I, I think it's really helped our service levels and helped for agent accountability as well. You know, we want to put them in position to succeed and if, if we have full transparency in what's going on and and uh, what the customers are telling us, then I think that's going to put them in a, in a good position. That's great. We're very glad to hear that you uh, that you like case flags. <laughs> um, what are some steps your agents take in order to review and resolve the support cases? Andy, I'm going to have you field this one just to follow up with what you were talking about. Sure. So, so what steps do they take to review and uh, and resolve this? The issue? Yeah, that, was that the just question? to yeah, walk absolutely. us through a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we have our associates organized in the in our three primary communication channels. We actually we do not have dedicated email agents or dedicated phone agents. Everyone cycles through. Uh, the the fee staff feedback that we would always get would be that people would get burned out on a specific channel. So uh, we we set it up a week in advance for this week. You're going to be doing emails and. And uh, we have this number of people on emails, this number of people on phones, and then we rotate around. That also allows us flexibility. That if we're really getting hammered on phones on a certain day, then then we can put, you know, we can react quickly and put other people in that phone queue. Now, the the people that are that are dedicated to email on a specific week, you know, with the case flags, uh, they're able to to tell the um, you know the the cases that have been sitting there the longest. We try to attack, uh, you know, we try to attack them as they come in, but we have a specific strategy once the, the flags 
get to, you know, kind of beyond our service level. And what we'll actually do is we will we'll have our team lead, um, we call it dealing, but they'll actually take ownership of that case and then they will uh, assign it to specific agents that we have set for email escal for a, kind of our escalation path is probably the best way to describe it. So we'll have people grab that email and then assign it to, to people as, as kind of a, a back-end check to make sure that nothing sits too long. And then once those those later emails are assigned, then we're able to kind of react on those and, and kind of go from there. Great. Thank you for walking us through that. Sure. Um, I'd like to ask both of you how you work with your VIP or high priority customers when you are working through case resolution. Uh, Jeff, I will go ahead and start with you and then Andy after. Mm -hmm. So um, our customers are tiered based on the size of the account. So, you know, think of it as, you know, um, you know, platinum, gold, silver. And when our customers, oh, sorry, when our support engineers are helping customer, they know specifically which tier they're in. And so we actually have different targets for different tiers. And, you know, um, I believe in keeping things, you know, pretty simple. Sometimes the, you know, the more you can make it simple, it sort of, you know, pays off in multiples. And so from a metrics perspective, we really only have two sets for our top, top customers and then everyone else. And so those those customer facing metrics that I mentioned uh, a moment ago, they're tighter, if you will. Um, so if it's a time based metric, it's uh, you know it's much you know the metrics are much more responsive, if you will, for for those key customers. So for instance, it's basically cut in half in terms of our goals. So our response time goal and our resolution time goal for our top customers, instead of it being you know, a two hour response time, it's one hour response time. And instead of like 80% resolve within two days, it's 90% resolve within two days. And, um, and we regularly, you know, meet those metrics for the top customers. So, and if we don't, then we make changes so that we can continue to serve them at the highest possible level. Great, great. Uh, Andy, how about you? How do you work with their VIP yeah. and high priority customers? Yeah, absolutely. So, so for us, we have our we measure our response time uh, similarly across all of our across all of our customers, our, our VIP customers or our uh, standard customers. The one difference, though, is that we will uh, once that that case comes in, we have a, a faster escalation path for the VIP customers. So essentially, we'll, you know, bring in the sales rep bring in one of our uh, bench scientists in, in that support group. So, so we will escalate it to uh, a, a team of resources a lot faster for the VIP, uh, VIP customers. So that would be the, the significant difference there. Whereas a smaller customer, typically that can be a little bit more self-contained with uh, the specific associate that's handling that. Uh, but, but for the, the VIP, you know, number one, we want to pull in the right resources. Number two, we want to provide visibility if it's a complaint. So that's our approach to that. Great. Um, Howard, is there anything you want to ask, talk through with how your team is focused on being responsive with this? Yeah, so um, I actually teach my team a little exercise that I uh, lovingly nickname Kill the Flags. <clears throat> and it's because we love using case flags. And what you effectively do is it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole, except there's only one mole that pops up at a time. So what, you're, what we're doing is whatever the most offending, worst performing flag is currently at the top of the pile. Um, and this is something that with our utility bar component, you just load that on your lightning view, the utility bar component, you open it up, the top one, that's the case you jump on. And your goal is to get to the bottom and make sure that that component doesn't have anything left in it. Um, and, then you can, and then you can relax. Now, of course, for each one, you're digging in and that's fine. And other cases may come in and get higher priority or lower priority. But by really just simplifying it into that kill the flags exercise, the top one, that's the case to attack, do everything you can to resolve it, move to the next case. We take out the guessing, which case should I pick up next, which is often when you're working, trying to decide which customer needs the right attention. That often really inhibits productivity. And I found that 
um, when I have people on my team that might not be as productive or they might get stopped by something, by just simply focusing them on the kill the flags exercise, that gets them aligned with like, here's what I do next. So there isn't this guessing game, um, but it's just something that I love to do. Great. I feel like all of those tools and tips were very helpful. Um, I, uh, we're getting close to the end here, but I definitely would love to hear from you guys about uh, a customer story example of how uh, the tools and processes that you use help with a specific customer. Um, Jeff, I'll go ahead and start with you. So we have, um, you know, um, by, so I mentioned um, a moment ago that we have three ways to, that we communicate with the customer. Um, you know, phone, email, and then we have a web portal as well. By far the most, uh, um, the, the highest usage channel is email. And there are so many scenarios, I don't have a specific story, but there's a lot of scenarios where um, other stakeholders related to that, that issue want to be kept in the loop. It could be the account manager. It could be the customer's boss. It could be the support engineer's mentor or the support manager, um, myself. And so um, without having um, email to case premium, it, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it effectively. We couldn't, we couldn't add someone to a case knowing that for any future interaction, that person would automatically be in the loop. And so now with, uh, with email to case premium, that option is there. Um, we can add a, you know, uh, an internal person very easily, an external person very easily, and it just, it helps keep everyone on the same page and informed. That's really helpful. Um, yeah. Andy, yeah. Uh, how about you? Do you have a customer story example? Yeah, absolutely. We actually had a, uh, a customer that we were working on that was uh, essentially working on a kind of a big project. They were getting specific funding and, and uh, they needed, needed some guidance from a, a number of different teams. And uh, to kind of pull this together pretty quickly. So it, it was a combination of not only needing a fast response time, but also needing some some resources from our, our uh, scientific application support team. So the 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 case flag uh, uh, process was very helpful with this because it, it allowed us to track the the uh, the kind of the ongoing response time for us and to make sure that they, the response time for this specific project always landed within a, a specific threshold. You know, they, while they didn't specifically dictate a, uh, a, an expectation on that, it was, they just wanted really thorough answers very, very quickly. And so being able to monitor that in real time on the case flag uh, and being able to watch that and then quickly escalate that to the right people uh, was very, very helpful for us because, again, the transparency of it and being able to kind of watch that come in and quickly pull in, uh, you know, pull in the extended team was, was very, very helpful for pulling that project together. Great. Uh, that was good hearing kind of the, like a real life example for, from both of you on this. Uh, it was very uh, informative. So uh, we're going to wrap up. Uh, today's webinar, and here are some key takeaways from today's discussion. First response time or initial response time measures only how quickly agents reply the first time. Responsiveness is the foundation for effective customer support. Your initial response should add value, and understanding how long the case takes to be resolved is essential. And we hope this information was would, is very impactful for all of our listeners today. And I want to specifically thank both of our speakers today. That's very helpful. Um, if you've joined us for this series before, this puzzle looks familiar to you. We talked today about how responsiveness is essential to prioritizing when work can get done and how it impacts the customer experience, but it's only one part of delivering that perfect service experience. 
The other three parts, personalization, utilization, and feedback, help complete that puzzle. And that's why we wanted to hear from thought leaders to further expand on their real life examples for how they prioritize responsiveness in their organization. I'm gonna thank our guests again today. It's Jeff Graff of MSC Software and Andy Rattler of Integrated DNA Technologies. Thank you both so much. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Next month, we'll be closing out our series and talking about how you can leverage customer feedback. We will be joined by Annette Franz. She is the author of Customer Understanding, Three Ways to Put the Customer in Customer Experience and founder of CX Journey. She serves on the board of directors of the Customer Experience Professionals Association and is an advisory board member of CX at Rutgers. We'll also be joined by Matt Dixon, Chief Product and Research Officer at Tether. He is the co-author of the Challenger Sale, the Challenger Customer, and the Effortless Experience. You won't want to miss that conversation. It's happening on October 31st. And you don't need to wear a costume, but we won't stop you. And I just wanted to open up the board for any questions coming in. Uh, right now, we don't have any questions, but we'll hang out here for a moment or two if you guys have um, any additional questions. That's great. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. Make every customer your first priority. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.